Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to chair the final keynote, and it's a spe special pleasure to uh, chair the keynote of Professor Thomas Sterling. So instead of mentioning or counting all his merits awards, I'll just remind you of his famous, for me, famous closing remark a year ago. And he was talking about exascale, how fast are we approaching exascale computing. And he said, and many of us started to smile, he said, yes, there's light at the end of the tunnel. That's good news. And then he said, but the light is red shifted. <laughs> now, the same happened. Half, half of the audience actually laughed. So I said, it's a good, a good opportunity to explain what that means. You have to understand a little bit of astronomy or uh, uh, relativity, Einstein's uh, laws of relativity. Red shifted light means you're going after an object, but it is disappearing faster than you can approach it. So what I hope we will hear in a few minutes, or hopefully at the end of his talk, whether now the light at the end of the tunnel is blue shifted, so we are getting closer to it. OK. Um, Thomas, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Frank. And uh, it is a pleasure to be here again. It's a true honor and privilege for me to have the opportunity to give the last keynote address at uh, ISC uh, 2016. I want to thank uh, the uh, program committee and the chairs for um, giving me uh, this, uh, this moment. Now, I'm, I'm sensitive to the fact that I'm between you and the rest of your lives. So I, I will try not to burden you too much with long, extensive uh, discussions. But this is a particularly interesting year, and I do have some thoughts to uh, share with you. Uh, I uh, want to thank uh, the uh, Maurer brothers and all the others for keeping us from Frankfurt. I'm running out of room for uh, different uh, Congress centers to put on this slide. Uh, I've done the count several times. I keep coming up with 13 years uh, doing this. Um, yeah, yeah, well, somebody found a picture of me that looks as old as I feel. And uh, I'm just thinking, what happened if you added another 13 years? Every year, we try to find a pithy phrase that captures uh, the sense of that year. Sometimes it's pretty challenging, like uh, when nothing happens and yet you have to get excited. This was an easy year. Uh, the, um, uh, it is clear that we are entering the age of 100 petaflops, and uh, this is not just any single machine, uh, but in fact uh, an international direction and, and an acceleration that has occurred after several years of what some perceive as a stagnation. Let me, let me just summarize for you briefly what I think are the trends and the highlights of the last year, and then I'll touch on some of them in greater detail. Well, as I said, the stagnation is over. I mean, really over. And um, there's no way around it. The Chinese dominate supercomputing big time. Uh, 100 petaflops is here. It's not something to be looking directly forward to. We have an unrolling of any number of systems over the next uh, two to three years that will uh, reach and surpass 100 petaflops. Those projects are already in order. But even as we move into the 100 petaflops era, there is a tremendous amount of planning in preparation for exascale computing, even as we are challenged to define what exascale truly means for the value of computing. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the U.S. program under the uh, National Strategic Computing Initiative and the Exascale Computing Project. Uh, I also want to touch on, as I do every year, a new and really impressive deployment uh, of systems uh, in the broader community, not simply the, uh, uh, the four major uh, users, but in fact in the, in the broader world as well. And isn't it appropriate for me to be talking about Africa? 
in the area of advanced technologies and architectures, usually you find we talk about um, uh, processor cores. It's a natural direction to migrate to, but this time I want to spend uh, as much time uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, communication fabric architectures as well. And I'm going to talk about two very, very different uh, cases there. Uh, I want to briefly give a shout out to uh, a new and emerging uh, community software stack uh, that may serve for everyone. And um, I, I want to uh, complete it by recognizing that supercomputing, as much as we love the iron and we spend a lot of time on the software, it really is about the end science, the end technology, uh, the end society, and even defense uh, projects and, and applications. And so I'd like to talk about one application in, in particular. And uh, finally, before I proceed, I'd like to congratulate again all of those who have contributed to making this conference uh, so successful. I learned uh, just this afternoon that they have broken all records of attendance and as of yesterday uh, achieved over 3,000 attendees. I think a round of applause is appropriate uh, for those who made this possible. So let, let me spend a, a little time talking about an emerging technology with which maybe uh, most of you are familiar, but I'd like to put it into perspective. Yes, I was lazy. Yes, I went out on Google. Yes, I grabbed some Intel slides. I found an Intel person said, is it OK? They said OK. So um, whatever copyrights I have uh, uh, failed with, I am particularly interested in the fact that uh, Intel both incrementally against its prior and methodologies for con continuity's sake, but also for advancing the capabilities, is, is developing and has been deploying uh, the Omnipath uh, communications framework. Now, it, it's a bit of a balancing act, right, to say nothing's changing and everything's changing, so don't be scared, but be happy. Uh, and that's essentially the marketing pitch here. But there are a couple of aspects of the Omnipath uh, architecture as it's emerging and becoming available that I think is, is worth mentioning. And it's the two major things. The first is a high message rate. Now, now that, you might think of that as synonymous with bandwidth, and it's certainly correlated, but not necessarily. Getting big, fat messages through is not such a big deal. But be able, being able to move many more messages, which may mean more fine-grained messages, is, is particularly valuable, especially for those applications in the data analytics, graph processing, and um, uh, 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 machine learning uh, applications, as well as future AI applications that, that we may find. If you can combine that, as they are doing with a low latency fabric to reduce the uh, in, innate time from source to destination, then you've got a winning formula. Now, what of course is special about this is the combining of the Omnipath communication, which again, in fairness, is derived from several other technologies as well as through some innovations, and combining it with the next generation of their a lightweight processor, this to be a night's nice landing. So Nice Landing is a significant processor on the order of three teraflops plus, depending on how you do counting on a per package basis. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, we'll see in a moment, I will show you a, a simple diagram, supporting out-of-core uh, uh, out execution using a, um, a vector processing unit uh, and, um, and supporting as much as 16 gigabytes of memory on a particular, uh, particular package. This is also including, I should be have a flip through this. Notice I was doing that from memory. That's pretty impressive. Um, this is, OK, I'm impressed. Um, the, I'm easily impressed. Uh, it, the, if you look up in the upper right, you see that, uh, that they have units of tiles. Some 36 such tiles uh, can be on a, a particular package, each with two cores, and each of those with two vector processing uh, units and a megabyte. And this is an important number, if you can retain that towards the end of my talk, and a megabyte of L2 uh, cache. The um, uh, uh, connection also, uh, th there is uh, multiple connections uh, to ex external memory and uh, to the, although it doesn't show it on this diagram, uh, to the Omnipath communication framework. Some uh, pretty pictures. The actual reason for me showing you this slide is because the single thing that interests and excites me most about Knight's Landing is it's moving off of the PCI bus, 
it's moving out of the quote-unquote accelerator category, and it's moving into the mainstream, the main uh, part of the memory uh, channel, and is the phrase used is self-hosting. This, I think, is of a significant difference and puts us in a very different um, uh, position in moving rapidly forward in easier to program and more efficient execution. One such machine in the United States that's being developed and will be deployed in the, I think, 2018 timeframe, if I have this right, is uh, the Aurora machine at, uh, to be uh, deployed at the Argonne National Laboratory. This is a big machine integrated by Cray called the Shasta Architecture. It's over 50,000 nodes and will uh, peak out at about 180 petaflops of computing. The memory is about seven petabytes, seven versus 180, think about that, uh, petabytes, and uh, it will be using the, the next generation uh, OmniPath. So uh, Aurora is actually serving as a target for uh, advancing the technology. It's dragging the technology uh, forward. It'll be very interesting. Um, it's also interesting because of a uh, projected power budget of 13 megawatts. Now, that, that's very impressive when you realize that, that we're in the single, well, depending on how you do the numbers, we're at a much lower power level, say 30, um, 30 uh, uh, plus, I'm, I'm trying to remember, 33, there we go, 33 petaflops, uh, Limpac, RMAX, at, um, at some 24, including cooling, uh, 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 megawatts of, 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 of power. So I'd, I'd like to highlight a couple of um, uh, systems. I spoke at before, and I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, South Africa, uh, CHPC, and, and happy Sitol. Uh, for their new machine, I'm going to pronounce it Len Gao. I have no idea how close I, I got to the right name. It means cheetah in one of the seven languages that are, are valid within, within South Africa. It's a petaflops peak machine. This is no small accomplishment. It's 15 times as much as the last machine that uh, CHPC just um, uh, uh, took off the floor. It's, uh, our max is an, is an effective uh, 783 uh, uh, teraflops. I don't know where that puts it on the top 500 list. It has about 126 terabytes of main memory. There are some additional fat nodes uh, for control. It's uh, developed by in combination with Dell and Intel and uh, Mellanox in the uh, development, uh, obviously, that part in the communication. And it has about four petabytes of, um, of uh, uh, standing storage uh, with a luster, a luster system. Uh, the, the bottom picture this is one of my favorite pictures of Happy. Uh, if you know him, um, and uh, oh, I guess that one's me too. I don't know. <laughs> Happen. Now, maybe you're not surprised about the machine in South Africa, but this one will probably uh, uh, surprise you. It's a couple of sigmas out, but it's an interesting machine because it's recognized, as we all do, that the, cre the key challenge to the future of, of scalable high-performance computing uh, is, in fact, data movement. And that historically we have been in a we have been using a framework in which heavyweight messages have been used to maximize the effective bandwidth of the communication of the communication uh, fabric and framework. The data vortex computer is a very different animal. It is created around a new class and a very different class of communication network. Okay, known as data vortex, built by a company known as data vortex. All right. They didn't have a lot of people. They couldn't come up with a lot of names. Um, the data vortex is focused on lightweight, fine-grained messages. In fact, very fine-grained. Each payload is only 64 bits, with uh, an address space also of 64 bits. So that's that's quite on the edge. It's a, a high radix, high bandwidth network with low net, with both low latency and it's contention-free. That contingent free is actually a piece of magic, uh, which is uh, very cool. Now, why, why am I, I bringing up a machine in which there are only a few sales to date, and in fact, relatively modest configurations have been, have been deployed? It's the promise, it's the potential of this graph. This is the classic S-curve graph that, that we should all be familiar with, with conventional networks. Uh, the, uh, uh, two, um, the two S-curves you see, uh, are taken from uh, uh, from uh, the data 
uh, using a form, a different tests on in, InfiniBand. This is no discredit or disrespect to InfiniBand, by the way. But that red line, if you look towards the left, where the payloads, the packets, are very small, the red line putatively does not decrease, does not reflect that, um, that uh, S-curve that you would expect. It gets a larger, for lightweight messages, for very special cases, it gets a, lar a dramatically larger uh, percentage of the total uh, available bandwidth in the communication fabric. Now, if you look out towards the right, you see that for heavyweight, very heavyweight messages, uh, more conventional uh, techniques uh, achieve higher, higher bandwidths. So this is a, if not domain specific, it's a domain narrow machine, but there are a wide range of applications uh, that are particularly well suited for this class and that in fact will benefit from this perhaps more than any, any other. Here's just some lightweight data points. On the left you see near the top some blue data, data points reflecting again the relative uh, narrowness or, 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 or modesty of the scale of the machines and how these in fact are going to scale out with larger systems is still unclear, although the anal analytical um, projections are very, uh, uh, are very impressive. Uh, but you can see how significantly different these memory intensive, lightweight, dynamic, and irregular messages uh, seem to be even empirically. So the US, I, I struggled to have a phrase that um, would let me get a, take some sort of positive approach to this and still be honest. <laughs> the US is in launch mode towards, uh, towards Exascale. Uh, shortly after ISC 15, uh, by executive, off uh, uh, <laughs> executive order by the President of the United States, uh, the National Strategic Computing Initiative uh, was uh, declared, was launched. The National Strategic uh, Computing Initiative, or NSCI, uh, is national in the sense that it's whole government. Uh, many of the agencies uh, that, uh, that um, both are uh, drive research, either overall or towards specific missions, or those agencies which are end users of high performance computing in many ways are involved. Also involved are uh, the, the, the national laboratories and centers, but as well both industry and academia to move the technologies forward to advance multiple forms of high end computing uh, in architecture and software stacks, methods for programming and for overall systems control. This is a 10-year program. The U.S. isn't very good at doing 10-year programs. Even getting to the moon didn't take us 10 years. And this is often referred to casually as the moonshot for, uh, for computing. Now, there are a number of uh, motivations or drivers, one of which is the unification of both a t a conventional numeric or technical computing, as it may be called, with data-intensive, data-oriented, graph-based uh, uh, methods for data analytics, uh, deep machine learning, and uh, other, uh, other problems associated with irregular and varying uh, data structures. One of the objectives, and it's, I've, I've highlighted it in red, is to keep the U.S. at the forefront of HPC capabilities. That's what it says. Of course, there's an underlying assumption there, which I'll leave to you. The key is to make HPC readily available well into the, into the performance regime of, of exascale or exaflops and over uh, in as much as into the 20-year into time frame. This is a Herculean task. It is challenging. It is aggressive. It is ambitious. And... Um, a little bit scary. To achieve this, one of the major efforts is the Department of Energy, and Department of Energy is one of the lead federal agencies in the U.S. government, is the Department of Energy's uh, exascale computing project. DOE is very sensitive about the term project. It's not synonymous with program, not synonymous with initiative. Project means a very specific, uh, rigorous, 
carefully regulated, highly professional, industrial grade activity uh, to lead to the end result. There are four major activities which are still being defined in detail. For those of you who had the uh, uh, opportunity to hear on Tuesday Paul Messina's talk, Paul is in fact um, leading, I don't know whether it's chair or director or czar of um, ECP, but uh, Paul gave a, a, a very lucid talk on this. Um, the four as you might expect, is application development. And application development is more than merely figuring out how to run codes on the machine. It's in fact to define the driver requirements for those very machines through a process of co-design. Co-design has become a, an important mantra, a cliche, but it's one to which uh, the contributing partners, the stakeholders, are, are committed to as the viable way to do quantitatively uh, driven and, and managed uh, projects of this type. The software technology is incredibly important. While the technologies must be near enough so that we can have risk mitigated opportunities for actually achieving operational and deployable systems. At the same time, they must bring in advanced capabilities that supersede those that we're using today. And those are in the area of processor architectures, uh, memory, uh, both uh, devices and uh, structures, and, uh, and finally, as I mentioned before, uh, communication fabrics. Uh, and so this brings us to the hardware technologies uh, in these areas uh, that um, are recognized as likely but have yet to be fully proven or deployed. And so there are, there are tasks related to this that will help industry, motivate industry, to extend those technologies forward in time for appropriate deployment in the 2023 uh, timeframe. And finally, there's the development of the exascale systems themselves. These are complex, likely to be heterogeneous, and heterogeneous doesn't just mean necessarily accelerators. It means heterogeneous memory systems and subsystems and uh, control uh, paradigms uh, for, for computing. They will certainly support conventional practices or incremental changes to conventional practices, and those are likely to be the way that, at least in the US, initial exascale achievement will be accomplished. But there may, may underline, be uh, uh, more advanced or more innovative approaches that at least will be fruitful for certain classes of problems which will become increasingly important to, um, uh, to uh, high performance computing in general and, and frankly to the, to the US um, mission objectives in particular. So in the last year, we lost marvelous Marvin. Not a tragedy, he was 88 years old. But in another 88 years, his work and his impact and I think recognition will still be as rich as it is today. Marvin Minsky is, for all intents and purposes, both the father of and synonymous with the term artificial intelligence in the same way that Seymour Cray is synonymous with the word supercomputing. Now, he worked closely with uh, Newell and McCarthy. I think McCarthy uh, actually coined the, uh, the term AI. Uh, and in the, uh, in the early years of the 50s and 60s and 70s, laid the foundation. He won essentially every award one can win, including the Turing Award in 1969, which is essentially the Nobel Prize for, um, uh, uh, in computer science. Note, Nobel wasn't smart enough. In fact, he didn't like mathematicians. Uh, but uh, he didn't have a Nobel Prize in computer science. Well, there weren't any computers uh, back then. Uh, Marvin, Min you may wonder why am I talking about Marvin Minsky at a supercomputing conference? Well, he's one of the great computer scientists, period. Uh, but he was also a very strong in, uh, influence on the development of one of the uh, world's most uh, famous SIMD machines, uh, the... the um, uh, d uh, commercially deployed one, the CM2, was in fact uh, a, a predecessor of what might be considered to be the prototype, the CM1. The CM1 was not developed to be a numeric intensive machine, although the CM2 and, and its, uh, its uh, follow-on, the CM5, were increasingly motor uh, oriented towards numeric computing. The CM1 was actually developed as an AI machine, uh, in particular to be a smart memory that held, held semantic nets. 
But there's another reason I, I, I acknowledge and, and bring to your attention uh, the passing of uh, uh, Marvin Minsky. It's because in all likelihood, and we're seeing it already at this meeting, probably one of the biggest, maybe the ultimately the biggest application or class of applications for supercomputing will not be floating dense matrix floating point, will not even be uh, large uh, data processing to uh, do pattern recognition and to do clustering. It will, in fact, be symbolic computing, the creation of machines that think, more importantly, the creation of machines that understand. And as many advances that are made uh, today in the area of what is called artificial intelligence and machine learning, let's acknowledge the fact that machines don't learn anything. We learn. If they learned, they would not just have data converted to information and pretty pictures, they would have data converted from information to knowledge and be able to manipulate that knowledge. We are not there yet. There's still an exciting world in front of us, and Marvin Minsky already set the path forward. He um, was back in the days, mostly, where money was a lot freer in the United States, before the Berlin Wall came down. He didn't really watch the political correctness. When, when asked how would humans uh, exist or coexist with uh, intelligent machines, he said, uh, if we're lucky, they'll keep us as pets. A few years ago, I was going through some slides and I saw, I'm a Star Trek fan, I'm sorry, I admit it, I saw uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, which was the only good one, right, yes. Uh, <laughs> And, and there was Mr. Data, or Commander Data. I trust most of you know who I'm speaking of. Please help your friends understand this. <laughs> okay, here's a scary thing. He, he, he was the epitome of artificial intelligence. Yes, with his positronic brain, thank you, Asimov. He was holding a cat. If the smart machines can find other pets, they may not need us. Marvin Minsky also said, uh, in a uh, somewhat more uh, sanguine moment, he said that, uh, yes, Intelligent machines will take over the world, but they will be our children. An interesting thought. As always, we as a community uh, continue to move forward, and although the accomplishments are at a very rapid rate, uh, we take a moment to acknowledge some of those contributions uh, uh, from many of our, our colleagues. Uh, Matteo Valero, the, who is director of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and professor at the Technical University of Catalonia, Catalonia beg, beg your pardon, uh, won the Cray Award uh, in recognition of uh, seminal contributions to vector, out of order, multi threaded, and VLIW uh, architecture. Alexandre Soleil, uh, another colleague uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins University and the director of the Institute for Data Intensive Services was awarded the uh, Sidney Fernbach Award for his outstanding contributions to the development of data intensive computing systems and on the application of such systems in many scientific areas, including astrophysics, turbulence, and genomics. And I will tell you, I know Alex personally, and um, I, have, I have to say that given his extraordinary breadth of accomplishment and its impact on the community, there, there has probably not been a more understated uh, uh, statement of credit uh, to him. Uh, my uh, friend and colleague, Kathy Yellick, um, of the, uh, uh, both the UC, University of California, uh, Berkeley campus, and uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, uh, won the uh, Ken Kennedy Award uh, for Advancing Programmability of HP Systems, Strategic uh, National Leadership and uh, Mentorship in Academia and National Labs. Working with Kathy is an absolute delight. Uh, I have known her for many years. We co-authored uh, one of her two books, uh, the one on UPCs. She also developed the language Titanium. Uh, Bill Carlson also on the UPC book, I'm sorry, okay, now we're gonna see if the red button works. They promised it would, look at that. All right, and finally, the uh, Turing Award uh, was given both to um, uh, Whitfield, Diffie, and Martin Hellman uh, for their critical contributions to modern uh, cryptography. Uh, all extraordinary accomplishments. Now, imagine I've gotten this far without actually doubling down on what we're all thinking and what we're all talking about. So the elephant in the room. 
Uh, Jack um, Dungara uh, taught me to say Tai Hu light uh, to my uh, Chinese colleagues. I hope that that is at least near the right pronunciation. Peak performance, 125 petaflops, 10 million cores. I, I, sh I, should, I should stop there. A very respectable 73% uh, efficiency on Linpack at uh, 93 peta petaflops delivered, and this with a fairly light clock rate of 1.45 gigahertz, which I suspect is largely responsible for a truly extraordinary power budget of only 15 megawatts. Well, 15 megawatts is a lot, right? I mean, one million euros per megawatt year, I think, is the rule of thumb. Just think how many windmills that is uh, going, going around. Uh, but uh, this is on the order of, I should have had a number somewhere that said uh, six, the equivalent peak of uh, six gigaflops per watt. Okay, for exascale, we've got to get up to something like 50, that five zero. But this is a very impressive uh, step forward. Uh, the, this uh, machine is at the supercomputing center in, okay, here goes nothing, Wuxi? Wuxa? Oh, come on. Somebody, they promised not to laugh. That wasn't a joke. I, all right, to, to my colleagues there, congratulations. Uh, the vendor is uh, NRC uh, PC. Um, I, uh, I uh, <laughs> through various channels, I absconded with, borrowed, uh, ultimately with his permission, Jack Dungara, uh, this diagram of a node uh, of um, uh, the uh, uh, Taihu uh, system. Uh, the node co comprises four different clusters, each of 64 uh, cores. Uh, each of those cores themselves uh, I, I have to remember this, uh, is a, a SIMD arch an eight-way SIMD architecture, a 64-bit floating point. Each of those cores uh, peak performance at over 11 gigaflops. Uh, they're all tied together. They have 64 K bytes of scratch pad, and while they have a small instruction cache of, uh, I'm sorry, I, uh, 64 K? Do I have that right? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, is it 16K bytes of instruction cache? All right. Listen, I didn't have these numbers like until three days ago, right? Okay. Uh, they also have um, uh, manage uh, each management processing, processing element in each of the, uh, each of the uh, 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 core groups uh, with a total of uh, almost 41 thousand nodes in this. It's designed by the Shanghai High Performance IC Design Center. Uh, pretty picture I grabbed here. You get the idea. Some uh, 40 cabinets, uh, each with about three petaflops, uh, four super nodes per cabinet, 256 nodes per super node, a higher, three level hierarchy. So, one of the pleasures I get from having this opportunity to speak to you on the very last day is I get to tell you what I think. So, I'm going to tell you what I think, then I'm going to tell you why that's wrong then I'm gonna tell you why in fact right. I sh shouldn't confuse you. Okay, shock and awe. There is a wow factor here. You know, let's sit back and really enjoy this for a moment. It's been a quiet few years, folks. And this is just a tour de force in terms of engineering. It's almost in fact three times the performance of their previous uh, and our number one machine, Tianha 2. Uh, which uh, held uh, that position for, for three years in a, in a row. For me, even more impressive is the fact that this is a, a China homegrown system. They uh, uh, designed the architecture, both structure and instruction set. They designed uh, and uh, they designed and deployed the, the electronics, and they did the systems integration. There are some parts which uh, con are contributed from outside, but I'll tell you, all, all of our big machines back in the States probably have some memory that wasn't homegrown, so I don't think anyone's going to say anything about that. And it's running some serious applications. In fact, I'm, I'm told that uh, the three Gordon Bell Prize finalists uh, are, have run on this machine, which is uh, really something to uh, t take note of. Also impressive is the fact, and you will have heard this if you were here for Eric's uh, talk on the first day, 
China now has the largest number of deployed systems, 167, uh, surpassing U.S. at 165 uh, deployed systems. And while the specific numbers don't matter, this indicates a key commitment, a commitment not just to having the high stature machines, but rather to having a large number of medium scale systems doing a lot of the heavy lifting of high performance computing. And as I've already said, uh, 15 megawatts is very impressive. Uh, and I did say uh, six gigaflops per watt. And it comes with the full software stack. Okay, that's what the brochures say, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing, maybe from people here in the audience over the next year, uh, just how many times they hit a seg fault or, or some equivalent problem. But, but uh, it looks like it is, in fact, the real thing, a full package, and it's open. They say it's open. I look forward to the international community telling me about their applications on that system. Okay, but let's be clear, not so fast, right? In terms of memory capacity, it's pretty lightweight. With 125 petaflops of peak performance, it has about one one hundredth that amount in terms of memory capacity at 1.3 petabytes. Um, and I made up the phrase in first capacity because I, I didn't want to do one to 100. Um, maybe that wasn't a good idea. The bandwidth. Also, in terms of the rate at which uh, information is transferred from the memory versus the, the peak rate of comp, uh, computing, uh, that uh, 22.4 flops per uh, byte uh, transferred is, um, let's say it's just pushing uh, out from where we were. Uh, Jack reports that the HPCG, uh, the conjugate gradient uh, benchmark uh, that uh, is proving uh, very realistic in exercising more parts of the machine is below 1% of its uh, uh, LINPAC number. I'm looking for Jack. Did I? Okay. He'll scream out if I say something really stupid. The bisection bandwidth is considerable, and the clock rate, of course, as I said, is under one and a half uh, giga. You may be wondering what that, uh, the, the, what the gentleman in the picture is holding. I, I, I'm not exactly sure. I, I am confident of this. It is a gray square. <laughs> I got that right. Yes? Okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm presuming this is, in fact, uh, the, um, the node uh, of the, the four, um, uh, uh, four clusters. Okay, so I'm, am I right or am I right? But not so, not so fast. Yeah, I made that up too. Technology is forcing us into a new class of optimizations, which we are reluctant, in some sense, intransigent in pursuing. But historically, if we look past over the last 60 plus years, we see that as technology demands, we define new methodologies and new architectures. So we have proceeded and in fact been through what I, by my count, is about six different epochs with key points of delineation uh, uh, moving from one paradigm to another paradigm. Perhaps I use the word paradigm a little bit too freely here. But as we have moved since, well, over the last decade now, uh, into the era of multi-core, multi-era, with strong emphasis on heterogeneous computing, we've all known that we've moved away from the more conventional and, frankly, more comfortable communicating sequential processes model uh, and, uh, and other techniques uh, that we've done. So it, it behooves us to ask the question, what is technology trying to tell us? And one is that FPU, floating point unit efficiency, is not the critical objective function. It was when I was as young as many of the people in this room, but it's not today. It is among the easiest things uh, to manufacture and uh, to uh, deploy. Uh, and so we should be making a lot of them everywhere. Uh, it's the memory capacity and the memory bandwidth that counts, I think but probably I should be slipping the word latency in there somewhere as well, and then I keep on going on and rattling on about overheads, which I'm not going to do. It's the instruction issue rate that counts, because it's the instruction issue rate that drives 
the, um, the memory bandwidth and ultimately determines the time to solution. And while we may argue about different metrics of performance, I'm very comfortable in saying ultimately by whatever normalizing uh, criterion you're using, time to solution is a solid one. It's one we can measure. The physics speaks to us uh, through that. And it's, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's what counts. It's the power and the power efficiency that we, um, we have to move to and, and improve upon. We routinely waste dye area by building enormous memory hierarchies on the chip for one purpose and then adding speculative execution in many different forms to including uh, uh, pre-fetching, um, speculative fetching, uh, uh, program, I'm sorry, um, branch prediction and, and any number of other mechanisms in architecture to do what? To keep the ALU busy. We could put a lot more ALUs that will run le a lot less efficiently if we clean up all that mess. That's what uh, the Chinese uh, uh, Tai Hu machine is doing, is attempting to do. So we should, should have, perhaps, we should be valuing the FPU availability, not the, not the utilization. This machine does that. And by the way, um, it was merely a, uh, eight years ago that I stood on this same virtual stage congratulating Andy White uh, and his colleagues from Los Alamos for the deployment of what was putatively referred to as the first petaflops machine, uh, that is, uh, uh, that with the cell architecture and Roadrunner. Roadrunner is a, a bird that runs around in New Mexico. It would, it would be a roadrunner if it had a road. Um, unkindly, sometimes the roadrunner is referred to as a flightless bird, which may be an unkind but perhaps appropriate um, metaphor here for the machine. The cell architecture, uh, and you're very familiar with the cell architecture, or your children are if they have or had a PlayStation 4, but I don't do much of my work on PlayStations, and um, uh, there were no there were no significant additional machines like Roadrunner, and we went on to a different class of machines. But we've been here before. And so the question we have, and I'm not going to answer this question, is going back to the idea of scratch pad memory, little or no cache, many, many independent threads, where no one thread has a high efficiency or high utilization, but the aggregate of those threads maximizes the effective use of the memory. Is that, in fact, a new formula to go forward? I asked you to pay attention to some of the numbers when I was discussing the Knight's Landing uh, processor and chip. You know, as a homework assignment, go back and do that comparison. You'll find some interesting similarities and some pivotal distinctions. I look forward to, well, I look forward to my talk next year. I'm assuming I get invited, and I'll be able to report. Okay, so last year, uh, struggling to find something uh, creative to say, I, I put forth uh, uh, other people's notion of a two-world view of high-performance computing. Uh, so I thought I better do something more advanced. So I now put forth a three-world high-performance computing system view. I don't promise next year would be a, four, a fourth world. We've uh, mined the uh, incredibly deep amount of data from the top 500 list over at least the last 10 years and done some simple uh, uh, linear uh, regression um, uh, optimization on uh, three, uh, three parts and uh, recognize that these three lines in a very excellent way allow us to define specify and distinguish in a much simpler way the complex uh, uh, top 500 uh, data and perhaps for some utilization. So these are the, the three world view. Uh, at the uh, uh, bottom are the average arm, well all of these are for average armx. The bottom is um, the, um, the mainstream uh, perspective that I saw, that long horizontal line that you saw. 
uh, the very steep vertical line that I refer to as leadership computing uh, uh, is uh, almost uh, two orders of magnitude higher. And in the middle, uh, with uh, some noise in it, is what we're referring to, for lack of better, as the, as the knee uh, part of the world or the knee, knee world there. We find that these are clearly distinguishing, uh, discriminating characterizations and uh, think that this uh, may help us to understand better than um, uh, just uh, thinking about the top 10 or not the top 10 uh, as, w as we go forward. Okay, as I, as I draw to a close, I, I would like to at least finish with an accomplishment, uh, a, an application, a workload that is having immediate impact in our, in this case, well, in our understanding of reality. But, but first I need to go back and, and take a look at a piece of history. In, uh, in 1887, I didn't take this picture, by the way. In uh, 1887, uh, a, a, the then expert in measuring the speed of light, uh, Michelson, and a colleague of his, uh, Morley, who is a chemist, that's an absolute irrelevancy to tell you that, uh, decided to uh, uh, both detect, to prove the hypothesis uh, of the existence of the ether and to measure it by by uh, using, exploiting the movement of the Earth through the, through the ether and then uh, detecting and measuring the change in the speed of light. This doesn't have a happy ending. Uh, Michelson was completely disappointed in the results and never really believed them. And, and Morley, by the way, that's sitting on a, it's floating on a bed of mercury, liquid mercury here. Uh, this is important because uh, Morley died of mercury poisoning. Not long, it, it, you know, it's it, not one of the best um, uh, best problems. Now, now, of course, anyone who has gone to uh, a, a physics high school class, uh, at least outside of the U.S., uh, knows the reason is because uh, Ethernet. I mean, the ether. Sorry, Ethernet. The, the, oh, I'm getting to the end. It's almost there. The, the ether doesn't exist, hence, the, the, uh, at least it shows the accuracy of his measurement. Um, you know, okay, now, if you were so unfortunate as to, in the U.S., go to what was is laughingly referred to as, as science class, um, you will have learned that um, the sun is 6,000 uh, years old, that it uh, goes around a flat earth, on the earth, slow, dim-witted Republicans were being walked all over by dinosaurs. <laughs> which I suspect, and this is just conspiracy theory, is why uh, the dinosaurs weren't, let to, weren't allowed to get on the ark. <laughs> and uh, you'd also learn that uh, the climate is just fine, thank you. Long live coal, and uh, we all better learn how to swim. move forth over a century from the Michelson-Morley experiment, and we have essentially the same experiment here um, with a slightly scaled up version of the original interferometer. Uh, okay, more than slightly. Uh, those are approximately mile-long legs. There are two of them, not one. Uh, one in uh, uh, Hanford, uh, Washington, and the other in Livingston, Louisiana. Uh, this is a LIGO, or the Lather Interferometric Gravitational Observatory, and I may in previous talks have mentioned that after spending more money on an NSF experiment than any other over 10 years and achieving exactly zero results, that the NSF amusingly added more money to it. Boy, was I wrong. In just um, uh, a, a few months ago, I think it was September in the event, gravitational waves were discovered. One of the great discoveries uh, in the history of human science and technology, combining the, the uh, extraordinary uh, accuracy of an instrument to measure perturbations in space-time smaller than the size of a proton uh, and, and be able to extract that signal and, co uh, and correlate it against uh, two different uh, systems. Now, what was determined was that the event that they were watching was a collision of two spiraling black holes uh, into each other. And the result was kaplowy. Um, that's a technical term. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know what the units are. Uh, here you had uh, two objects, one about 29 solar masses, another 36 solar masses coming to together in, through accretion and creating a new black hole of 62. Now, if you do the math quickly in your head, you're wondering where those three solar masses went. Well, in a matter of tens of milliseconds, they turned into energy and were translated into, into um, uh, perturbation of the space-time continuum. More power was released in that fraction of a second than all the rest of the power in the known universe combined. This is an extraordinary discover discovery, akin to the discovery of the uh, uh, Biggs, uh, Biggs boson, Higgs boson, complicated, Higgs boson by the Large um, uh, Hadron Collider, and uh, 10 years ago, the discovery uh, of the expansion, excuse me, the acceleration of the expansion of the universe itself. Every one of these involved important and large-scale instruments, but they also involved supercomputing. Without supercomputing, they would not have been possible. Here are the actual signals that uh, were detected. Supercomputing is not only to detect the signals, but in the case of detecting gravitational waves, the filter or the templates used to extract those signals have to be pre-computed from, the, from the, uh, the, the original physics, the, the foundational principles, in some cases using numerical relativity, in order to find the patterns of the signals that would imply or determine uh, an actual gravitational event. So, in conclusion, I, I'm not going to summarize what I've just said. Uh, rather, I would like to leave us with a question, a serious question. And I'd like to talk about supercomputing, what I call supercomputing in the shadows, or shadow of supercomputing. This is an exceptionally successful meeting. The floor continues to grow. I learn things every time I come to this meeting. And of course, the second event in November in the United States. We are the HPC community, but do we in fact represent high performance computing? HPL, and I'm a big supporter of HPL, I love the data, it's a beautiful data set. I'm beginning to sound like someone else. The data set is huge. The data set is so successful you'll get bored at how, I'm sorry. But HPL is self-selecting. We only see what others want us to see. They, and we are they, they decide whether or not to send in their numbers. They decide whether to run the benchmarks at all. This is not a good sampling strategy. Anybody who understands uh, simple statistics knows that this is not the way to do it. There is a whole world of high performance compu computing hidden in the clouds. And of course, I'm being metaphorical here. Amazon, Google, Microsoft, some of you may know how big those systems are, I don't. But they are enormous, and we don't see them through our methods of evaluation. Sometimes they're hidden by intent. The intelligence community, and I'll just say this, I've been in the basement, leave it there. The financial and banking, they don't like to give that information. And, and in general, the defense community. Some of this is enormous, quite possibly dwarfing what we view. And finally, there are special purpose devices uh, being used, um, such as uh, the Anton uh, machine. Uh, uh, some years ago, John Salmon, I think, gave one of the plenary, if not keynote addresses on Anton for n-body problems, specifically for molecular dynamics. Uh, and the uh, SKA is developing a very complex configuration of a, a multiple computer system in order to manage and, and process uh, all of that tremendous data looking forward to the results from that. I mean, I ask, how would we run LINPAC on a on a uh, quantum computer. Right. So I, I really leave you with this question. Do we really know how fast fast computing is? And if not, how should we as a community broaden our reach, our perspective, to quantify and evaluate 
the trends in technology, the trends in architecture, the trends in applications that span the entire set of what high-performance computing is and will be. Thank you all very much for your time and patience. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Take some questions. Okay. Professor Sterling, Thomas Sterling will take some questions. Um, please. There's a microphone. A lonely microphone. So let me at least <laughs> ask you one question. Okay, Frank. Uh, and We've very been through this before. <laughs> it and uh, um, I'm grateful yet that you mentioned astronomy, relativity, and uh, the obvious question is, Thomas, is there now blue light at the end of the tunnel? I, I think that that's a fair statement. I think that the light at the end of the tunnel is indeed blue shifted. I don't know what the second derivative is, but uh, I do know that uh, we can be satisfied at this meeting that we saw a quantum step forward uh, and moving toward uh, uh, goals of ever, ever increasing computing capability and application opportunity. Again, thank you all very much. <laughs>